Statistics, standard deviation of means estimate example. Get ready and some coffee because if we want to get futuristic, we need statistics. You're not first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're currently in the OneNote presentation section, 1930 standard deviation of means estimate example tab, looking at a scenario similar to recent example problems where we are imagining we want to find information about a large population. However, we can't test every item within a large population therefore the strategy take a sample of that large population test the sample hoping that we can apply the findings from the sample to the characteristics of the large population two strategies that we could employ number one hypothesis testing number two confidence intervals hypothesis testing lending itself to situations where we might think we already know what that middle point is for example, if we're trying to estimate the number of peanuts in a bag of peanuts, we already have the average on the bag of peanuts. We might be taking a sample of bags of peanuts then to see whether or not the results that we get from the sample are going to confirm what we think should be that point. And so in that case, you can imagine then the bell curve being constructed around the hypothesis. The sample is going to be somewhere away from that middle point because it is a sample. And the question is, is it further enough away for us to reject the original hypothesis? Confidence intervals, on the other hand, typically lending themselves to situations where we really don't know what that middle point is, and that's what we're trying to estimate. So you can imagine if we took a hypothesis test situation, the average of the sample, we can imagine is gonna be our middle point, and we're gonna basically make a, a range around that middle point. Now you could still think of it as though you can have a hypothesis testing scenario in that whatever the mean that you get is, you can imagine, well, what if the mean was out here? That would be my hypothesis. And I built a bell curve over here. If the actual sample came up to something over here, would that be further enough away for me to reject this as my hypothesis? And then we can have multiple hypotheses asking that question and we would end up with a range that would be like peak to peak and the middle point would be between them. However, it would be easier for us to imagine just constructing a bell curve around the middle point from the sample. So whatever we get from the sample, we say that's the middle point. I would like to construct a range around it with the use of a bell curve if we could use the bell curve or if not possibly using T distributions, which we'll talk about in future presentations. But that's the general idea now a couple things to keep in mind if we like if we take a look at our data here this is going to be the data uh, that we're going to be using and we're imagining then that let me pull this out for a second that we just did a sequence calculation so that so that we can put the count down here and then we did a random number generation between numbers 1 and 10 Therefore, this population of data that we constructed in Excel, if we were to graph it, would not be bell-shaped per se. It's going to be more of a uniform type of, of distribution. So if I was to look at the actual data, it might look something like this. So where it's, where it's kind of even up top. It doesn't have that nice bell-shaped curve. So remember, one of our issues that we have is that we would like to be using the bell shape curve for some of our testing because it's easy for us to look at the area under the curve sometimes, and it's easy for us to define the curve by using just two numbers, one being the middle point, that's the standard deviation, the second being, I'm sorry, the middle point is the mean or average, the second being the spread or the standard deviation. So that means that 
what we could do is use the central limit theorem concept to say, well, if I imagined every possible sample combination of whatever sample size that we're going to be using, then the mean of all those numbers will tend towards more of that bell-shaped curve. So that's what we're looking to do, which we'll get into more shortly. Note, we have this formula here that's gonna approximate, in essence, the standard deviation of that number, the mean uh, of the mean of the means, right? Or well, it's gonna approximate the standard deviation of all the means of all the samples. So when we look at this concept, we can think about the mean in terms of the mean of these numbers, the average of the actual population. We can think about the average of the sample that we take from the population or the mean, or we could take the mean of all of the possible means. All three of those numbers will tend towards the mean or central point of the population. However, when we look at the standard deviation, it's a little different. That's the one that gets a bit confusing. That's where this formula comes into play. We wanna get a little bit more intuitive understanding of kind of how they put this formula together so that when we use it in practice, we have an understanding of what it is, why we are applying it, rather than just kind of saying, I put this formula in place on step number five and that's just what you do so that when you have an intuitive understanding, you might be able to work out different scenarios and explain what you're doing and find better insights <laughs> about the work you're doing uh, because you have some better understanding of what is going on here. So remember with the standard deviation, we can have the standard deviation of the population, which would measure the spread of the population, which you can get with this data but the spread of the population isn't bell-shaped, right? So we can't create like a bell-shaped curve uh, from that information. We can also get the standard deviation of the sample. So in other words, we're gonna take a sample of this, which is all we would have in real life because we couldn't test every item in the population usually. That's why we take a sample. The standard deviation of the sample might uh, be used as the standard deviation of the population if the standard deviation of the population is not known. But again, it's still gonna tend towards something that might not be a bell shape, right? So that's why we wanna use the central limit theorem, which is the idea that we're gonna take the all combinations of whatever sample size that we're going to be using, which we don't actually do in practice, although we saw an example of doing that before to prove the concept so that we would get, in essence, the standard deviation, which we can call the standard error or the standard deviation of X bar. That's, and that's what this formula is basically going to be calculating here, which is gonna be the standard deviation of the population, which would be these numbers, if known. If not, it might be the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of little n, which stands for the sample size. And then we saw if basically the population, big N, is fairly small, that's when you might have to tack on the second bit, but we're usually gonna imagine you don't have to tack on the second bit, which would be the, uh, the correction factor. Okay, so if we take our data, this is, this is giving us information about this data, which is, which is uh, gonna show that we have a count of 10,000 in our population data. The mean is 5.5. That's just going to be the average, adding all these up, divided by the number of them, which is 10,000. And then we have the standard deviation of the population, which is the 2.853, which measures the spread. But uh, the spread isn't in like a bell-shaped curve, so we can't use that, in essence, to construct a bell curve from it. So here's our calculations for the count and the standard deviation of the population. So then we can imagine, well, what if we took uh, multiple samples here? So we're gonna say that if I took like this first sample, I have this sample and we're adding up down to the bottom, how many of these did we do of 100? So we took sample one, this is the sample in the column is the sample, and then there's a count in the sample of 100. So this is sample number two, and within the count of sample number two, there are 100. So little n is 100, big n was that 10,000. And then how many times did we do this? We did 10 samples of 100. All right, so, so that's gonna be the data that we're gonna be taking a look at. And then I'm gonna pull this over. So instead of us going to the bottom of this and putting the mean of all of these, 
I'm going to say I'm going to put that over here instead. And and by the way, how did we get these samples? It's we're taking random numbers from this population. A couple ways you can do that in Excel, but in Excel you can do that and practice this with an index function taking that array and then looking at random numbers between the first and the last row, which in our case is row one to 10,000 because there were 10,000 items. So these are just random numbers that are coming from the actual population simulating you know, a sample. Uh, and we did it over 10 times. So sometimes you might not have 10 samples. Uh, sometimes you might only have you know, one sample of you know, the 100. But we're imagining the formula that we're looking at as though we took every combination of sample of uh, 100, which of course is impossible really to do in practice, but that's the idea of this calculation to help us with the central limit theorem basically kicking in. And so how could we come up with that, that formula? Well, there's a relationship between the, you know, the sample size and the standard deviation that helps them to come up and derive in essence that formula. So we have the mean of s uh, of, of a sample so this is the average of one sample so now you could say that we have the average of the population which we wouldn't know usually uh, and then we have the the average or mean of one sample of 100 in this case which would still tend towards the same middle point as the population and then we have the standard deviation of the population which we may not know we have the standard deviation of one sample, which should tend towards the standard deviation of the population, which we said was do, 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 the standard deviation is 2.851, and this is 2.64, all right? But, and then we have, uh, and that's the calculation of the standard deviation of the population. All right, so then we've got the means of all of them. So if I took then each, of the samples and I took the mean of each 100 samples so now I'm looking at each of these samples 100 and I'm taking all of this column here of 100 calculating the average or mean of it and that's what these are coming out to so remember that's the average number of the sample of 10 which you would think would come out to around 5 because we did a random number generation between numbers 1 uh, and 10, right? So you got 5.31, 5 point on sample 2, 5.94, 5.6, uh, 4.9, and so on and so forth. And then we took the standard deviation of uh, the standard deviation of these samples. So now this is taking the standard deviation of 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 10 of the actual samples. So remember with the standard deviation, we could take the standard deviation of the population, the standard deviation of one sample, and this time we're taking the standard deviation of 10 samples, which is, simul is kind of simulating the idea of taking of this formula, this formula being based on the idea that we took, we take the standard deviation of all possible combinations of whatever sample size from the population. In other words, all possible combinations of sample 100 in the population of 10,000. So we're kind of, we're, we can't simulate that whole thing, but we can say, well, what if I took 10 samples and I took the standard deviation of the 10 samples or the standard deviation of the mean of 10, of 10 samples. So then I can say, all right, the population, here's the population mean and the standard deviation of the population. So, so the difference between the the mean up top 5.46 and 5.45 is pretty close so the average you would expect the average to get closer as we took the average of each sample it's going to tend towards the middle point and the average of all of them is going to be uh even closer you would think so the so the actual average and it wasn't actually one through ten i took zero i think it was zero through ten that's why well it's actually the the mean is 5.45 not not like exactly five in any case it's off by 0.1 and so that's pretty close and then we've got the standard deviation estimate x bar standard error and this is calculated with our formula so our formula over here was uh was the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n 
which is going to be uh, the sample size in our case of 100. So if I take a look at that, then we could say, okay, that's what this calculation is doing here. Square This divided by the square root of 100 is at point uh, 268. And then if I look at, at the difference between this and what we have up top, this is approximating us taking every sample. We only took 10 samples, but we've, we've got the 0.345 and this comes out to point uh, 286. So just to get an idea, that's why we're trying to get an idea that this formula basically works because there's a relationship between the sample size and what's going to happen to the standard deviation. The standard deviation that we're getting from the formula approximating all means, of course, is going to be smaller than the standard deviation of the population. And that relationship is predictable, which is why we can basically simulate it with a formula. And, and so that's the idea. So then we have, uh, let's, let's do the same thing uh, with a sample of 10. So this is the same thing, but instead of taking all 100 sample one, we're just taking a sample size of 10. So sample one is from here to here, sample two is from here to here and so on and so forth. So now N is different. And that means our standard deviation of X bar, which is imagining the standard deviation of all possible sample size, this time not of 100, but of 10 out of the population size, which was uh, 10,000, right? So the means of just the 10 numbers are these, that comes out to 5.6. And then the standard deviation of all of the means, which is kind of approximating the idea of the standard deviation of all possible samples of 10 within the population of 10,000. And so this is the actual calculation. So we have a difference now of the mean came out to 5.6 versus 5.45 for the actual population. So it's a little bit further off, which is kind of what you would expect because now we have still 10 samples, but instead of sampling of 100, we're only sampled 10. So, so you would think it wouldn't be as close as basically the one up top where we sampled 100. The standard deviation estimate is now going to be our formula here, which is going to be the population divided by the square root, right? This is our formula over here. The, pot, the standard deviation divided by the square root of uh, the sample size, which now is only 10 rather than 100. So we have the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size, which is 10 now. And that, if we compare that then to our standard deviation that we got up here to, to it's going to be once again fairly close so the intuition we want to get from this is that this calculation this calculation makes sense because there's a relationship between the population standard deviation which is represented by sigma which is always going to 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 be smaller when we get to the standard deviation of x bar representing the standard deviation of all combinations of sample size of whatever sample size within the population and so, so that's divided by divided by uh, the end so that relationship is constant that's why they can basically make a formula for us to you know, approximate that all right so just we'll just make a curve from this data now just so we can finish this up and practice our bell-shaped curve so we have then our curve is going to say the lower uh, X to the upper X. This is us trying to find the range on the curve. We'll build this in our Excel problems multiple times because if you're doing this by hand, writing out the curve is really useful. But for me, I was never really good at it. And it, it always kind of, uh, so ex to do it in Excel is a little technical, but if you can get it done in Excel to make a picture of it is quite nice. So what we're doing here is we're trying to say, hey, look, this side, I want to take four standard deviations. Remember, two standard deviations gives you like 95% of the data if it's a bell-shaped curve. If you go out four standard deviations, then basically almost the entire curve is under the same place. We can also measure it in terms of Zs, which means that zero would be standard deviation zero, and then the Zs would be the steps up 
or we can measure it in the related X's that we're talking about. So that's how we're building this. And we, we then build that with our, our formula of here is, here's gonna be our X's, which is gonna go from, we went from four up to like six or seven. And then we did our calculation. We, we did our calculation of norm.dist to calculate the probability at each of those uh, points. Uh, and that gives us our percentages. And then we did the Z calculation, which is taking uh, each of the X's minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So this is giving us our X's uh, in terms of Z, how far away from the middle point they are. And you can see here like this one, 4.33 is four standard deviations away. So 4.33 uh, is here is around four standard deviations away. Right, 4.331, 4.33, it's right here, here it is, 4.33 right around here. It's all rounded, but that's the idea. So, so, and then this is gonna give us the middle bit. And oftentimes when we look at these graphs, we're often saying, okay, if I look at the middle bit, that's where like 95% of the data is, and that should be like two standard deviations. So this should be two on this side. Here's the standard deviations, two on this side. And that's gonna be the orange area. And the ones outside of that area uh, are gonna be are gonna be the, the 5%. So there's 5%, the sum of both of them are often like around 5% on uh, both sides. So that's the beauty of, a, of the bell curve is that the idea could be the whole thing is 100% under the curve. If we go around two standard deviations away, you got that 95%, and then the then the other 5% on the ends, remembering that when we're thinking about hypothesis testing, we're often thinking about this middle point as the hypothesis sized data, the, the, date, the, the middle point being what we hypothesize to be, our sample then being something other than that middle point because it's a sample, it's not gonna be exact. The question being, is our sample far enough away for us to reject the original hypothesis? Whereas with the confidence intervals, we're basically thinking of it usually as though we're gonna construct a bell curve or possibly a T distributions, which we'll talk about later. And that's, that then is gonna be the middle point, right? And then we're trying to create a level of confidence in essence around that middle point in some way or another either using the bell-shaped curves or the T distributions, or you can think of it similarly as though it's hy hypothesis testing, like you're looking at every point around it and seeing if that was the middle point, is the tail still in there? But again, it's easier to think about it as, so that's kind of the difference between those two methods, right? Under hypothesis testing, we take the hypothesis and build the curve around it and see if the sample, how far it is away from that middle point with with the confidence intervals we basically are thinking that's like the middle point meaning the mean of the sample is in essence the middle point and then we're somehow making an interval around that middle point to give us a level of confidence